So, Misfortune as a Gift is the title of my talk. And Lady Gaga <laughs> starts my presentation. Probably the last slide you expected to see as I start in on my talk today. I'm actually not a huge Lady Gaga fan. I have admired the way she has stuck to her values and the way she sees herself. What I am a fan of is the title of this album, Born This Way. You see, that's an answer that I've used a lot in my own life, Born This Way. A question that I've heard since I was a little kid, what happened to your hand? My answer ultimately ended up being, I was born this way. Had a lot of creative answers that came in between there, but ultimately, I was born this way. You see, I was born missing my right hand, and I never wanted to make a big deal about that. I still don't. I know that there's a lot of people out there facing a lot more daunting challenges than I have faced. But being born this way, I knew what it was like to be different. I knew what it was like to be on the outside looking in. That's my first day of kindergarten, by the way, speaking of being nervous. <laughs> being born this way, I knew what it was like to be different. I knew what it was like to be on the outside looking in and wanting to prove yourself. And my parents used to say to me when I was a kid, Jim, what's been taken away once will be given back twice. You have to believe that. What's been taken away once will be given back twice. More has been given to you than was ever taken away. And I think they were trying to encourage the positive in my brother and I's life. I think they were trying to encourage us to see the blessings. And one of those blessings in my life growing up, and you may not hear this sentence again too often, I come from the great town of Flint, Michigan. <laughs> Vehicle city. <laughs> Anybody heard of Flint recently? <laughs> and I don't mean to make light. I'm awful sorry to see what's going on back there with the drinking water and all the problems. And I have some good friends who are affected deeply by what's going on. But I, you know, growing up in Flint, Michigan, it was a fantastic place to grow up. It was a blessing. It was a tough town. It has always been a tough town. Hit hard by unemployment and crime and, uh, and drugs. And there were a lot of ways on the streets of Flint, Michigan to get yourself in trouble. But what was great about my hometown, what was great about Flint, Michigan, was the people. Parents, coaches, teachers, friends, teammates. People who recognized the trouble that was inherent in that city, and people who tried to offer alternatives. They used to open the gyms up at night in Flint, Michigan, so that the kids had somewhere else to go besides the streets. And because they opened those gyms up at night, and we had great games of basketball and dodgeball and volleyball, we ended up having a lot of great athletes in Flint, Michigan. And for a kid who felt a little bit on the outside looking in, who wanted to prove himself, who wanted to be a part of something. Those athletes were my heroes. The teams that they played on were what I aspired to. To go to the movies at night and to see one of those athletes with a high school varsity jacket on meant something. That's who I wanted to be. And what was great about Flint, Michigan, was those coaches and those teachers who allowed me to get into the game, who provided the opportunity for me to play because I couldn't play the game like everybody else did. I had to do things just a little bit differently. And there was always somebody there. People give me a lot of credit. And they say, Jim, you must have been so courageous and you were motivated and inspired. It was none of those things. There were so many times I was filled with uncertainty and self-doubt and thinking that I couldn't do it. And there was always a teacher there to help me to find a little different way to do things. There was always a coach who literally grabbed me by the jersey and brought me into the game. You know, it was my second grade teacher 
Mr. Clarkson, who taught me how to tie my shoes. I didn't know how to tie my shoes in the second grade. Up until that point, my parents had triple knotted them and sent me to school and said, don't untie your shoes for any reason. <laughs> but Mr. Clarkson recognized this problem. And he showed up to the classroom one day. He took me out in the hallway. He put two chairs across from each other and he said, I got it. I figured it out. He had a film on for the rest of the kids in the classroom. I don't know what was going on in there. But I remember the smile on his face and I remember him tying the shoes and working with them. And Mr. Clarkson was a big man. He was Gordon McNeil's size. And I remember him sitting in a small chair with one clenched fist working with those loops and those laces and the smile on his face and the fist pump when he got done. And he said, I figured it out. This is how you can tie your shoes. He had gone home and worked with his own shoes. Imagine that generosity and that spirit. I know I'm wearing loafers tonight. <laughs> Has nothing to do with Mr. Clarkson's ability to tie shoes. It was the same way all the way down the line. There was always somebody there to encourage me. My high school, I played a quarterback in high school. If we have any coaches here, I'd never played football before. I'd played some baseball, I'd run cross country, I was a skinny kid. The head coach for our football team in high school called me up, I was sitting at home, it was my junior year, two a days it started up for the football team, and he said, hey Jim. I said, yeah. He said, I hear you have a pretty good left arm. Yeah. He said, get down here. You're playing football this year. I said, hey, coach, uh, I've never played football before. He said, get down here. You're playing. Now, he was going to be my history teacher that fall, so I knew I better get my butt down there to that practice. I went to the equipment room, and they gave me a helmet and pads and shoulder pads. I didn't know how to put any of that stuff on. I walked on that practice field. Everybody seemed to know where they were going and what they were doing. And I'll never forget the generosity of those coaches that day and for the next few weeks going forward. They all took time out of that practice to figure out how it could be that I could take the snap, how I could get the football from the center. If I just used my right forearm as a hand, if I dipped down a little bit lower, I could get the ball. Right? And to make the handoff to the running back to my left, I couldn't hold the ball like this. Right? So what if I just grabbed the football, grabbed the very end of it, held it like this, we could make the exchange without causing a fumble. Right? Those small adjustments, that little different way of looking at things allowed me into the game. Baseball was the same way. What I took away from my playing days, what I took away from my experiences of growing up a little bit different, of playing in the major leagues, of playing in great cities like New York City and Chicago and Anaheim, even Milwaukee. <laughs> what I learned is that challenge is ever-present. That challenge keeps coming at you. On the field, off the field, during your career, after your career. And challenge comes in many different forms. Each and every one of us has faced challenge and will continue to face challenge. And it comes in many different forms and disguises, right? Challenge can come with great success and higher expectations. And challenge can come with great difficulty and disappointment. Everybody here at Sage Hill knows a lot about challenge, athletically facing St. Margaret's in a CIF championship game, facing Crean in a conference championship game. I always hated Crean. <laughs> Academically, right? The challenge for great grades and board scores and what college will I ultimately end up in. Challenge comes from well-meaning parents and teachers. It can come internally with that pressure we put on ourselves, that uncertainty and that self-doubt. But big picture, what if we can come to look at challenge a little bit differently? What if we could begin to look at challenge as an opportunity, as a chance to prove ourselves, as a chance to reveal 
inner strength. One of my favorite books that I ever read, and I'm proud of being a baseball player who's read a book, <laughs> was a book called All the Pretty Horses. Has anybody ever read this book, All the Pretty Horses? I mean, it's a funny title. It was written by my favorite, Arthur Cor my favorite author, Cormac McCarthy. I still don't understand the title. Maybe there's an English professor here who could explain it to me. But I love this book. The book was given to me by a friend and a mentor, a person who used to pass along books to me, you know, with passages somewhere hidden within them that he thought might guide me along in life. And within this book, All the Pretty Horses, there's a paragraph, there's a conversation between the protagonist, a young American boy and an older Mexican woman. And they're talking about their life philosophies. And it ultimately ends up with this older Mexican woman talking to this young man and telling him about a life-changing experience. You see, she talks about losing a hand in her youth and how her entire life was spent reconciling that disfigurement, early on hiding it, and then figuring out how she could ultimately become a person of worth. At the end of this conversation, she says to this young man, and I know this is the quote my friend hoped for me to find someday, she says this, those that have endured some misfortune will always be set apart, but it is just that misfortune which is their gift, and which is their strength. Imagine if we could look at misfortune and challenge and adversity as if it was a gift, as if it was a chance to reveal inner strength, as if we could embrace those challenges that come at us. What I've always loved about Sage Hill High School is that it doesn't matter how you were born. It doesn't matter how you were born. There are many people here who have been born with every advantage. And there are many people here who have had to scrape and claw for every single thing that has come their way. But none of that matters. As we leave here, as we all walk out this door, we know challenge will come our way. But if we've learned anything, if my hometown, I hope if they've learned anything, I hope they can draw on that grittiness, that toughness, that deep-seated belief that there is a solution. As we walk out these doors into 2016, I hope you all know that nothing can stop you. If you can be tough, if you can be creative, if you can believe in who you are and what you can do, nothing in this world can hold you back. Big picture, there are so many great things that are possible in this world. And each and every one of them are within your reach. And it doesn't matter how you were born. Thank you all for a great night. I appreciate being here.